I am so excited to be your host and get all this good information over to you. I hope you're enjoying this from the comfort of your home, your friend's house, or wherever you might be. We are so sad that we can't have you here for this year's fair, but we have come up with some rootin' tootin' fun ideas, things for all of you to enjoy. That's right, we're gonna be exploring Colorado and some of its incredible industries, including agriculture, mining, parks and wildlife, and all kinds of goodies. Oh my goodness, we also have super duper special guests. <laughs> I'm so excited for Circus Imagination and a few others. Oh, just wait, it's gonna be good. Now I know that y'all want to be involved in this year's fair, and that's all right, since you can't be here, we still have ways for you to be a part of the fair. That's right, we have a junior ambassador program. All you gotta do is hop online, get signed up, and if you do it during fair camp, we got a reward for you. Yeah, we're gonna give you an official certificate even a badge and some other goodies. That's right, it's like a swag bag for fair camp. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have a very special guest today and I'm very excited. But first, I wanna tell y'all what we're gonna go over today. We're gonna go over dairy, wheat, and snakes. Oh boy. Now, my guest and my friend from Parks and Wildlife is here today. Let's give it over to Erin. All right. Hi, everybody. Well, I hope everyone can hear me. Feel free to note in the comments if you need me to speak up a little bit more. But I am so excited to be here with all of you today. So again, my name is Erin Kendall, and I work for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And I'm the school programs coordinator, so I get to work with schools around the state and help provide all kinds of great info and help get kids outside. So if any of you all have ever visited a state park before, or if any of you all have ever been hunting or been fishing, I want to thank you for support our programs here at Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And also, that is part of our role of, at Colorado Parks and Wildlife, is we manage the state's wildlife, as well as our 42 state parks. So we want to make sure that wildlife is healthy, and that they're doing well, and they have plenty of habitat. And we also want to make sure that there are places where people can enjoy the outdoors, whether they like to go fishing, or hiking, or canoeing, or just to have a nice picnic outside. So on that note, we are gonna be watching a brief video about snakes and snake sheds because I'm actually here to talk a little bit about snakes and reptiles today. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. So if I can go ahead, I'll turn it back over. Uh, we're gonna see a little video on it, what snake sheds, what they're good for, what they do. And then I have some other cool things to share with you all. Snake sheds are something that many of us have seen, whether out on a trail or at a nature center. But why do snakes shed their skin to begin with? My name is Elizabeth, and I work with Colorado Parks and Wildlife in the Schools and Outdoor Learning Environments program. And today, I'd like to shed some light on snake sheds. As animals, we all shed our skin to some degree, whether it's exposure to the sun or particles that come off when we bathe. But the way snakes do it is entirely different. Snakes, like other reptiles, have scales that allow them to move, keep in moisture, and offer general protection to their body. Scales aren't the snake's skin, but actually a layer of protection above it. These scales are made up of a strong protein called keratin, the same material that makes up human hair or fingernails. It feels dry to the touch rather than slimy, like some might think. Scientists call the process of shedding skin ectasis, and it's only ice for snakes. During ectasis, snakes develop a dull, bluish-white appearance just before they begin to shed. And that's because snakes don't have eyelids, like that of mammals, and cannot blink. So instead, their eyes are protected by a thin layer of scale called the spectacle. This can cause a change in behavior for the snake, including increased anxiety. Here with the Soul Team, we see this as a time to leave our Soul Educator snakes alone. Imagine having your eyes covered up if you were used to seeing out of them. They might make you a little on edge, too. Snakes shed their scales in order to help them grow and also to help to get rid of damage and unwanted parasites. The process usually takes about one or two weeks and can happen throughout the year. 
Recently, our solo educator snake horse here went through that process. Now with his new set of scales, he's able to educate new sets of students to come. Is there a topic that you'd like to see us cover? Go ahead and add it to the comments below. So let me see if you are able to access the chat. I'm not sure if everyone is, but let's just give this a try. I want to know what makes a snake a snake. So if you could go ahead and type in the chat box. Again, we'll test it out. We'll see if I can see this okay. But anything that you know of that makes a snake a snake. And if my host could help me out here, co-hosts, if we're seeing anything. Okay, let's see, someone noted a snake is a reptile, very true. Uh, let's see, someone said scales, excellent. They all definitely have scales, love it. Anything else? That is true, snakes do not have legs. They're a type of reptile that does not have legs. Oh, and very good, Wendy said no eyelids. Very good. So we have some really good ideas in here, and I, I see we also have a couple myths. So that means something maybe that someone told you perhaps that they thought was true uh, or that are really good ideas, but hopefully we can learn a little bit more about that. So, so excellent. You all have written plenty of comments. I really appreciate that. Let me go over a few of them now. So a couple of you mentioned they have scales, and they all do have scales. So as you can see here, hope, at least hopefully you can see this, this is a snake shed and it's doubled over. So it's actually a snake that is probably like longer than I am tall. <laughs> it's a pretty big snake. But like other reptiles, so like turtles or lizards or crocodiles, they do have scales, these little parts on their skin that protect themselves and keep themselves nice and strong. So scales are huge. And as you may have heard of in the video, they can all shed their skin as well, typically all in one piece, just like you see here. Um, I, I saw some people mention that either they're warm-blooded or cold-blooded. So we are what is called warm-blooded. I want y'all to think, have you had your temperature taken in the past few months? I know I sure have. I had to have my temperature taken when I visited the dentist this morning. So for people, we're all typically, if we're healthy and we're feeling okay, about the same temperature, about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. But reptiles, they're cold-blooded, and that just means that whatever the temperature is of the air is the temperature of their body. So again, reptiles, including snakes, are cold-blooded. It doesn't always mean their blood is cold. Um, some people mentioned that, oh, well, maybe snakes are deadly or maybe they bite. So anything with a mouth can bite, whether it's a goldfish or a lizard or a bird or a fox or a snake or me, right? I'm not going to bite, but I could. So we all have the ability to bite. But some things that make snakes special are those scales. They are cold-blooded. Most of them also do lay eggs. I want you all to think, do we think snakes have bones? Think about it. Think about if they have bones or not. Hmm. Well, I want to show you this. They do have a backbone. Absolutely, Wendy. So they actually do have bones. So this is a snake skeleton. And if you can see kind of close up in there, they actually have bones not only in their face, but they have a spine just like we do that goes all the way down their body. So if you will actually take right now, go ahead and feel in your back. You should feel a few bumps. So the, you're actually feeling your spine up in your neck or in your back. So we have a backbone just like a snake does. And if you feel kind of down in your chest, you can feel some um, bones underneath your skin as well. And those are our ribs, just like snakes have ribs, but they have a lot more ribs than we do. So now that we've learned a little bit, just a, a little tiny overview of snakes, I want to let you all meet a live snake. So this is a snake that is actually an education ambassador animal here with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And uh, this snake happens to live in my office. So this is not a wild snake that I went out and caught. It's actually a snake that's grown up around people. So let me go ahead and get it out of here. Give me one second. I have a little travel uh, cooler here. And I want you to tell me, if you think you know what type of snake it is, you can go ahead and write it in the chat box. So this again is a type of Colorado snake. And if you think you know what type it is, feel free to go ahead and write it in the chat box. Um, 
one thing, as a few of you noted in the comments, uh, they do smell with their tongue. You're absolutely correct. So that's what our snake here is doing, is it's flicking its tongue, and he's going, okay, you know, it just smells like a person. It doesn't smell like something I want to eat, and it doesn't smell like something that wants to eat me. So as you can see, does he look like he's being aggressive or like he's about to bite me? Really, he's just hanging out. Okay, and one thing before um, we get too into the O is here, rattlesnake. If you can see his tail, is there a rattle on his tail? Not a rattle, it is striped, it's a striped tail, but not a rattle. So I'm gonna be honest, I would not be holding a rattlesnake. They're also amazing snakes and they're also really important here in our state in Colorado, but not a snake that I would be holding because that is a venomous type of snake and they can have very strong venom. Uh, bull snake's an excellent guess. This guy actually happens to be what we call a Western hog nose. All right, now let's see if you can get nice and close up to the camera. I know it's a little bit dim, but hopefully you can see our snake there sticking out his tongue. So the Western hognose snake is found throughout the plains in Colorado. This is a close-up photo of what their face might look like. And they have this little upturned snout. Again, they live in Eastern Colorado. So whether you live maybe down near Pueblo or near Denver, along the front ranges, we call it, they're actually pretty common, but they're not out and about that much. They tend to like being underground. Someone asked what his name is. So his name is Neville. If we have any Harry Potter fans in the house, um, he's named after Neville Longbottom, the Gryffindor. So uh, that is his name. But again, he's not a wild snake. He's an education snake. He's used to people. I would not go up to a wild snake and just pick it up like this, right? But again, he's pretty chill. He's, he's pretty used to people being around. Okay, I got to show you one cool thing, though. Uh, Western hognose snakes can do. I only have a few minutes left, I believe, but this is kind of something interesting they can do. So if you could look at this picture, does it appear as though this snake is alive or dead? So it says Western hognose snake bluff behavior, and I'm already seeing some comments. So this snake wants to look dead, right? This is what a dead snake looks like, in fact. You can see like he's, you know, or he or she, this particular snake in the photo has its tongue out to the side. It has roll on its back. In the bluff behavior, they, they'll like go to the bathroom on themselves. They can sometimes even squirt a little bit of blood out of their mouth or their eyes. I mean, they look rotten. But as a few of you notice, I think as Maya um, and Nikki noted, so they're just playing dead. It's called bluff behavior because they're trying to bluff or fool a predator. A snake this size and this slow can't get away very easily. So what it can do is it can try to stay safe from predators like a fox or a hawk or maybe a coyote by playing dead. It's gonna roll on its belly. So if you all can see it has kind of black and yellow colored scales on its belly and it's gonna try to convince you it's dead. If an animal paws at it and flips it over, it's gonna roll right back again on its back and say, no, no, really, I'm dead, I promise. So I just think that's a really cool adaptation that these snakes have. And does anybody know uh, a reason snakes are important? Any ideas? So we sometimes, sometimes there's a lot of fear about snakes and that's okay. It's definitely okay to be cautious around an animal, but honestly, most snakes on the earth aren't even venomous. So let's see, oh good, I love it. I, there's a lot of really good ideas in there. So they do eat rodents or rats. Someone said they eat rats next to our farm. That's absolutely correct. So we need animals like snakes, including rattlesnakes, that are out living in different ecosystems throughout Colorado, really, except the very high tops of mountains. They live all over Colorado, whether you, you live in the mountains or on the grasslands or by a wetland. Snakes call these places home. And without natural predators like the snake, we'd have really too many wild mice and rats and insects that might eat our crops or our gardens. So they really are important. They even provide food for other animals. And some snakes like the rattlesnake, their venom is actually being studied for things like um, heart disease or diabetes to actually help people too. So there's a lot of really great ways snakes are help, helping people. All right, I, I know we're about out of time. I wanna answer just a couple questions if that's okay. Any of the other hosts, feel free to cut me off if I'm bad out of time, but I'm seeing a lot of people ask about how old it is. So our Western hognose is about seven years old. So this is a smaller, I would say smaller than average Western hognose snake, but it is full grown. So let me see. I, I think there's been other questions. I'm just need to scroll up just a moment to see 
how old it is. Someone asked what it eats. Uh, so this snake, so we feed our snakes mice that are already dead. So they're frozen. We thaw them out. And this little guy here is not going to be able to eat a full-size mouse. So it will eat smaller mice. And let's see, I think there's a couple more questions. How can you tell how old it is, Cammie, if that's what you're asking? So uh, he was actually donated to us. So again, this snake has, has never lived in the wild. It was born in captivity and an organization that works with live animals. They had an extra Western hog nose and they asked if we wanted to use one for education. And because they had had it for about its whole life, they were able to tell us how old it was. Um, we believe it is, a, I, I believe Vander asked a question, what gender is it? So it is a male to our knowledge. That's what the breeder noted by looking at a snake. It's not like a cat or dog. You can't just look at it and tell. But um, if you do take it to a veterinarian or a specialist that works with snakes, they can actually tell you whether it's a male or a female or boy or girl. So we do believe this is a male. All right. Uh, let's see. And can you count the markings on the tail for age like buttons on rattlers? That's a great question. And just a quick note with um, the buttons on rattlers, on rattlesnakes, I should say, uh, they don't necessarily grow a new button each year. It's just whenever they shed. And with snakes, all snakes do shed. But in the case of the western hognose, they're not going to grow a new stripe each year. That's a really great question, though. Well, I think I'm about out of time. And I believe that uh, we need to move on to another presenter. It is fully grown though, by the way, that's a great question, but thank you so much to all of you for participating. Excellent questions. I could just keep going on all day, but I'll go ahead and stop myself. But again, thank you so much just for your time and for hanging out with Nell and I today. And if you see a snake in the wild, remember, just give it space, give it some room. It usually will slither right away and you can remember to thank it for the important role that they play in our environment. All right, thanks everyone. Wow, thank you so much, Ambassador Aaron. Who knew that snakes were so essential to the ecosystem? Man, that excites me. Now, now y'all actually asked some really good questions. I'm very impressed. You are quite a group of campers. Now, I want to remind y'all, you can jump online and get your camp companion book. We sent out a link this morning, but don't worry if you didn't get it. You can jump on our website, go to their camp page, give it a little click-a-doodle, and print it right on out. Now, I know we can't physically all be together, so we brought some live entertainment for you, and I'm so excited for our next guest. They're going to be inspiring you and me and everybody else on some really cool things that happen at the fair. So I'm going to hand it over to our ambassador, Miss Carol, from Circus Imagination. <laughs> Hello everybody, my name is Carol from Circus Imagination and today I'm going to teach you how to do a tiger face paint. It's super easy. You can do this by yourself. All you're going to need is black, white, orange, yellow face paints. Let's do this. This tiger mask is going to have a white mouth and also white eyes. One curve on this side. Follow the nose, one curve on that side, and you want these curves to end together with your lips. And then fill it in. Just one stroke, touch the edge of your eyes, curve in and up. Now let's do the second stroke. Start on the edge of the eye, follow your eyebrow, and go up and touch the other line. Same over here, start on the edge of your eye, follow your eyebrow and go up and touch the first line. Now fill those in with white.
So get your yellow brush. And the first thing I want you to do is starting from in between your eyebrows, paint your nose. Now from your nose out, I want you to follow the white line right there. And again on the other side. Now, whatever is left of that yellow in your brush, we're gonna fill in those lines. Fill, 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 fill. And then here, fill, 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 fill. So I wanna make sure that when I do my orange, I leave that outer hair, outer line available to outline. Just like this. Start right here on the white part and push your brush in and connect to the yellow. Now go a little bit under and do it again. Connect to the yellow and then again and then again. All the way down to the white. Now let's do the same to the other side. Same thing for the top. Start in the middle. One stroke down next to it. And just fill it in. For the black outlines, I'm gonna use a thin brush. The first stroke, I want you to angle your hand up, start at the edge of your nose right there, and we're gonna go up and follow that white line. Then again on the other side, edge of the nose, up, follow the white line. Now let's do the lion nose. Start on the side of your nose, go up, down, up, and down. Now fill in the bottom. Now I want you to do one straight line coming from under your nose to your upper lip and widen it at the bottom like a triangle. This stripe is going to go up and come back down. Up and down. Again on the other side, up and down. Let's go up and up. Now let's outline the face. Start on the top of your white, follow it down and match your lip. And on the other side. Now let's give it some stripes. Let's start with the eyes. I want you to do three curves over here to connect. One, two, three. Again on the other side. One, two, three. We're gonna follow the smile line up and down. One, two, one, two. One, two, one, two. We're making the hairs. One, two, one, and let's give our tiger teeth straight down from the edge of your mouth. It was really great to face paint with you. Subscribe to our channel for more tutorials. I'll see you next time. Carol, I'm feeling ferocious. Rawr! How cool is that? I can't wait to go home and try that. Now, we have got really exciting things for y'all, but I also want to let y'all know you can get involved even more with things going on. We have got a local mining group for kids ages K through 12. That's a huge stand, and they've got a program called Move Next Gen, and we've got 
last year's competition winner, Camille, with us today to share some things about how you can get involved and learn a little bit more about mining. Check it out. What did one penny say to the other penny? Let's get together and make some sense. Hi, I'm Camille Bernal. Let's dig into how to make some sense about copper. For starters, just imagine a world without copper. No video games, no tablet, no music player, no speakers, no dance party, no flower. Without copper, we wouldn't have those things if we didn't have copper in the world. The U.S. Geological Survey estimated that every American born in 2008 used 1,309 pounds of copper during their lifetime for necessities, lifestyles, and health. That's a lot of copper. But that copper doesn't make itself. Through mining, concentrating, smelting, refining, and casting, copper makes its way from a natural state into the very items we use and rely on every day. But doesn't mining hurt the earth? Well, thankfully it doesn't. Mines today are very friendly to Mother Earth and make sure she doesn't get sick for many years. Now, in order to make copper, we need very special people with very special skills. To find out who helps make copper, I sat down with James Stabinski, a geologist from Freeport Morency. So here at this mine, we have both a technical and then an operations staff. Uh, with technical, we employ anywhere from geologists to engineers to metallurgists that help the process along the way. And then on the operations staff, we'll have haul truck drivers or any other type operator are going to work equipment or move copper or help process copper to get to its final form. Thanks, James. Now I'm going to let my sister Zalani tell us more about copper. Hey, guys. It's day it's the book because those are the floppy books. And I was, if I was going to put you, and I was yours, crying, and you are Zali Bye. Awesome story, though. In the end, without mining, there would be no copper. And without copper, there would be no dance party. The next party. Wow, Camille, you are incredible. I'm so inspired. You really know your stuff about mining, girlfriend. Now, if you want to get involved and you want to also win some cash prizes and have your video for maybe next year's fair camp, go ahead and check it out on our website. You can register for the competition starting on September 9th. Now, be that early bird that gets the worm because you can technically sign up until January, which is a really long time. So make sure you get involved. And there's so much to do right now. Maybe you can even incorporate it into a school project. Maybe extra credit, I don't know. Now, I am so inspired to get involved in this competition, but I'm also inspired by food and yummies for the Tum Tum. And my friend is here today to teach us how to make one of my favorite fair foods, funnel cake. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, give a drum roll to my friend, Chef Jason. Hey, I know what you're thinking, campers. You're thinking, I can't be at the state fair, but I'm ready for some funnel cakes. We'll tell you what, we're here to deliver. We've got a great funnel cake recipe we're gonna do today. Simple ingredients, right? A little bit of Biz Quick Mix, some eggs, milk, and vanilla. Then. We're gonna dust them with some beautiful cinnamon sugar. We're gonna be frying today, so let's get some help from our parents. Make sure we keep everything nice and safe. We're ready. Let's get in here super close. We'll show you how to prep this recipe. 
Well, I always like to keep that recipe right in front of me, right? Because it's really handy to be able to refer back to. So first thing we need to get made is that cinnamon sugar because when these funnel cakes come out of the oil, we want to let them cool for just a minute and then go right into cinnamon sugar. So we added a cup of granulated cane sugar. Now we're going to go ahead and add cinnamon. Now, here's the cool part. I like to add as much cinnamon as I like, and I love cinnamon, so I recommend two tablespoons, but feel free to adjust that how you like. Now we're going to get it all mixed up and ready to go. Okay, we've got our four cups of BizQuick mix all set and ready to go. Next, we're gonna add five large eggs and uh, you know, I think we'll just go ahead and get those guys cracked and ready to go. One, two, three, four, and five. Next, we're gonna add two cups of whole milk. Uh, I went with whole milk just because it tastes a little bit better. Uh, I think a little bit more fat and just delicious. So we'll add two cups. One, two, just like so. And next we're gonna finish this with a little bit of vanilla extract. And I'm gonna add a tablespoon. All right, now we'll go ahead and get this all mixed up, set and ready to go. And then we're gonna get over there and preheat our fryer oil. And I'll show you how we're gonna do that extra safe. Okay, we've got our candy thermometer all set. You can see right there, we've got it dialed at 350 degrees. Now, it's important to note, make sure that candy thermometer doesn't touch the bottom of your pan. Now, for this, you can use a uh, cassoulet pan if you want, or even cast iron. I'm gonna use this pan. This is uh, one of my favorites here. And now, we'll go ahead and fill up the oil. Now. I'm only gonna go right up to the bottom of the rivets because oil is gonna expand, but then when we add food, it's gonna expand even more. So I'm gonna go about a third of the way up, just like that, and now we'll turn this on. Our temperature today, 350 degrees, is gonna be what we heat this oil up to, and we'll monitor it here with our thermometer, making sure we are extra safe and set and ready to go. While that oil preheats, we're gonna go ahead now and fill our squirt bottle with our funnel cake mix. Now, I went ahead and cut the top nice and wide open, right? Because we don't want anything to uh, clog it up. We wanna be able to get everything set and ready to go. So now, very carefully, very carefully, very carefully, and only a little bit on the side, maybe a little bit on the front, and just a little bit over there. <laughs> we'll go ahead and get this filled up with our funnel cake batter. Okay, the oil is preheated. We've got our uh, funnel cake batter loaded in the squirt bottle. Now, here's what I do. Let's start off carefully. Keep your hands away, but we're going to start making those beautiful loops that turn into this epic, amazing, delicious, tasty funnel cake, right? Now, we're going to let these guys go for about 45 seconds a side, right? We don't want to get them too dark. We're just looking to get them cooked. Now, I've got a uh, spatula, a fish spatula I can use or a pair of tongs. Carefully, we're gonna go in there. We're gonna guide this over, always turning away from you campers, never towards you. Look at that, beautiful, absolutely fantastic golden brown. All right, we took it out, we put it on our drain pan just to let it drip for a little bit. A cookie sheet works great, and it is time to dust it with some cinnamon sugar. Look at that, guys. How is that for absolutely fantastic? Quick, simple, easy, delicious. Now you've got those Colorado State Fair funnel cakes at your house. So we'll go ahead and get this now over onto our uh, picnic plate. And you know what, guys? I would tell you this. After you cook, right, before you serve it to your friends and family, you should always do a little bit of quality control, right? So I'm going to try this for you. Make sure it's fantastic. Happy camping, guys. I'm Chef Jason. We'll see you soon. Now remember kids, make sure you get help from your adults. Now adults, make sure you're 18 years of age or older before you assist the cute little niblets in your home. Now, what, what was that? Oh, oh my gosh, y'all. We have got a super special guest. I'm so excited that this person is here today. Check it out, our special guest. I hope you're all enjoying the State Fair Day Camp. I'm Governor Jared Polis, and the fine folks from the Colorado State Fair are inviting me to stop by virtually and say hi. I hope you're enjoying 
the amazing variety of state fair activities offered this week. And I'm personally looking forward to doing all the recipes with my family that Chef Jason showed us. I can't wait to try it at home. Make sure to always get help from your parents in the kitchen, especially around flames and knives. We can't wait to welcome you all back to the fair in person next year. Don't forget to submit your day camp workbook to earn your day camp package, which includes your badge and a free fair pass to the next state fair. But until then, stay safe, mask up, and enjoy this year's reimagined virtual state fair. Thank you so much, Governor Polis, for taking time out of your day to share that with us and be a part of Colorado State Fair. Oh, how exciting. Now, I found me some milk and oh, it was so delicious. I actually have a friend that's going to teach us how the milk gets on your shelf in your very own homes. So ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, without further ado, I present to you Ambassador Jennifer. Hello campers. My name is Jennifer Sharvey and I am the Executive Director of the Colorado Foundation for Agriculture. The Colorado Foundation for Agriculture is a 501c3 for nonprofit organization that implements the Agriculture in the Classroom program across the state of Colorado. We are part of the National Agriculture in the Classroom organization. Did you even know there are Agriculture in the Classroom programs in nearly every state in the United States and several U.S. territories like Guam and Puerto Rico? Agriculture in the Classroom even exists in Canada. Our purpose is to advance agriculture literacy. Now that's a big phrase, agricultural literacy. What do you suppose that means? Let me see if I can pull up my chat feature here. There we go. We strive to help pre-kindergarten through 12th grade educators and students. to help you understand and appreciate the food and fiber system that we all rely on every day. Let's see, there's some chats coming in. So if you have questions throughout today's presentation, feel free to put those questions in the chat feature. The chat feature will only work for those registered to day camp and are participating through Zoom, which I think most of you are. My coworker, Melissa Walter, the education coordinator for the Colorado Foundation for Agriculture, will be monitoring the agriculture related questions and comments. All right, let's talk about dairy. Now would be a good time to ask someone watching with you to gather the materials needed for the ice cream in a bag activity. If you don't already have them near you, you will be entering Cam's classroom soon to complete that activity. The list of activities and supplies can be found on the Colorado State Fair Day Camp webpage. Okay, now what do we know about dairy? We're going to do a little interactive activity. So on another web browser, on your computer or on your phone or maybe your tablet, please go to www.menti.com. So that's M-E-N-T-I.com. From there, you will put in the code. So you're going to go to an, open another uh, web browser on your computer, or if you have a phone or another tablet, open that and go to menti.com and then put in the code 15634487. Oh, we've got a few that are coming. You'll want to keep this open throughout the camp as we'll come back to it a little bit later. Is everyone getting that figured out?
All right. Great. So on your Menti, you'll see this question. What is your favorite dairy product? Type your answer in and we'll form a word cloud with everyone's responses. Once you have sent your answer, you can allow anyone else watching with you to submit an answer. Look at those answers coming in. Ice cream, cheese, milk, yogurt. I see someone answered eggs. I wonder if eggs are a dairy product. So my favorite dairy products are cheese and ice cream. I could live on cheese and ice cream. Okay. Butter, that's a great answer. Do we have them all? Oh, someone said sour cream. Very good. All right. Cottage cheese, whipping cream. Excellent. All right, let's move on. Thank you everyone for participating. We'll do more interaction with Menti later on. Now let's learn about the dairy community in Colorado. There are 178,000 dairy cows in Colorado. Those cows produce more than 4.5 billion pounds of milk. Moo. Dairy products, the milk, cheese, yogurt, ice cream, all the great products we talked about earlier, is Colorado's second greatest agriculture product, generating $761 million in 2018. Now, someone mentioned eggs earlier, and eggs are actually from poultry, from chickens, not a dairy product. There are dairy cows in 11 Colorado counties with Larimore, Weld, Morgan, and Fremont counties having the most. All of those numbers are according to the Colorado Department of Agriculture. Have you ever wondered how milk goes from the farm to the fridge? Let's watch this video from Dairy Max to learn more. Dairy Max is a nonprofit dairy council representing more than 900 dairy farm families across eight states, including Colorado. Dairy farmers feed and care for their cows. Nutritionists design a specially formulated diet for the cows. Farmers provide regular visits from a veterinarian to ensure their animals are healthy and happy so they can live long lives. On average, farmers milk cows two to three times daily. Great care is taken to ensure each cow is milked in clean and comfortable conditions. This ensures that milk is safe and high quality. The milking process for each cow takes five to 10 minutes two to three times each day. Once the milking is done, the cows and milking equipment are cleaned. Then it's time to start again. Milk leaves the cow at 100 degrees Fahrenheit and is quickly cooled in two hours down to 38 degrees. This ensures optimum quality. The cow's milk is then stored in a bulk tank on the farm where it's kept cool and fresh. Milk is transported from the farm to the dairy processor by an insulated stainless steel truck. The truck keeps the milk cool and clean. The bulk tanks are sealed to prevent contamination from an outside source on this journey. Milk is continuously tested to ensure it is high quality. Quality commitment starts on the dairy with good animal care and extends to the milk tank trucks, the processor, and the grocery store. Rest assured, the dairy foods you enjoy are wholesome and pure, just as nature intended. 
At processing, milk goes through several steps from pasteurization to homogenization before being packaged. The first step in processing is milk is tested again for antibiotics. When the milk passes inspection, it travels into large insulated containers to pasteurization. Pasteurization begins once milk has successfully completed all quality and safety tests. This food safety process heats the milk to destroy harmful microorganisms that may exist. The heating is followed by a rapid cooling. Pasteurization is recommended by the FDA and Center for Disease Control and has been affirmed by the American Medical Association and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Following pasteurization, milk is then homogenized and packaged before being distributed to retail stores, schools, and homes. From the milk processor, milk and other dairy products are moved to grocery stores where people can buy them for their homes. From the farm to the fridge, rest assured, your dairy foods are safe, delicious, and nutritious. Wow, I sure learned a lot about how milk goes from the farm to the fridge. Now, let's take a closer look at a dairy farm right here in Colorado. Long Meadow Farm is located in Greeley. And I'll let Nora tell you her story about her daughter Nina and little grandpa. My name is Nora Felposh, and this is a book that I wrote about my family, our farm, my daughter Nina, and great grandpa. It's called Little Grandpa and Me, Learning to Be a Dairy Farmer. My name is Nina, and I live with my family on a farm in Colorado. This is my great grandpa. He grew up on a dairy farm just like me. I call him Little Grandpa. He calls me Nina. I am five years old, and I've been a farmer my whole life. So is little grandpa. Little grandpa taught my grandpa and grandpa how to farm. He taught my mom and dad how to farm, and now he's teaching me. Little grandpa says a lot of things have changed since he started farming. When I was a boy, I had 10 cows, and I had to milk them all by hand, he tells me. There was only one lantern in the middle of the barn, and we had a pump outside where we had to go to get water. I milked those cows by myself every morning and every night. You must have really loved cows to work that hard, little grandpa, I tell him. You bet, little grandpa says. Now, same as then, you have to love cows to be a farmer. Even with lights, running water, and tractors, farming is still hard work. It still gets cold and hot, wet and dry, and still, no matter what, farmers love taking good care of their cows. Our farm in Colorado has lots of cows. Little Grandpa says he was glad when my grandpa and grandma worked hard enough to buy more cows, because then they could hire some helpers to help get the cows milked every day. Now that we have more cows, our farm is not just for our family anymore. Lots of people who work on our farm have families too. Aunts and uncles, cousins and friends, and even brothers and sisters can help out. Same as when the farm was smaller, little grandpa says, all of us need to work together to get the job done. This barn is called the parlor. It's where the cows come to be milked. Unlike when little grandpa was a boy, we use automatic milkers to milk the cows. They milk every cow the same way. Cows mostly like things to stay the same. When he was milking by hand, little grandpa only had enough time to milk the cows twice every day. With automatic milkers, we can milk the cows three or even four times a day. This keeps our cows more comfortable and helps make more milk. This is how we take care of the baby cows. 
Each little cow has her own house and pens. I feed the calves bottles and keep their water pails clean and fresh. It's a lot of work to keep the calves comfortable. Little Grandpa says how I do my job is really important. Always treat the calves gently, talk softly, and move slowly, Little Grandpa tells me. Every time you take care of the cows well, they are learning to like people and to enjoy living on our farm. We do lots of things to keep the cows and calves healthy on our farm. Here we are feeding them just the right kind of food and keeping their pens clean and dry. We even have a special doctor called a veterinarian who visits the farm every week to check on the cows. He listens to their heart and lungs and makes sure they're feeling good. Here I am learning to, learning to listen to my own heart and lungs. Every day, a big truck comes to our farm to pick up the fresh milk. The truck takes the milk to a plant where it's bottled. Some milk is made into cheese, sour cream, yogurt, powdered milk, and ice cream. Here's a picture of me and my friends eating our favorite treat. We drank the milk we got from our cows the same day when I was a boy, little grandpa says. Now the milk is sent to be put into bottles. Still, it only takes two days or less for the milk to go from our cows to the grocery store shelf. Do you like to drink milk? Do you like to eat ice cream? The next time you do, you can think about little grandpa and me working every day to take good care of the cows that make your milk. I hope the next time you are in Northern Colorado, you will come to visit my farm. If you love cows and you love working together, maybe little grandpa can teach you how to be a dairy farmer too. I just love that story. Do you want more dairy goodness? You can take a virtual field trip to Longmeadow Farm and learn more about Nora, Nina, and their family dairy. Discovery Education and the National Dairy Council created a virtual field trip experience, complete with lesson plans and student activities. You can check it out at Discover undeniablydairy.com slash virtual dash field dash trip. I'll put the link in the chat box or you can contact me after camp for more information. Okay, do you have your supplies ready? It's time to enter Cam's classroom and learn how to make ice cream in a bag. Hey there, State Fair campers. Jonathan and Sarah here. Welcome to Cam's classroom. Today, we're going to be making ice cream in a bag. Fun fact, vanilla is America's favorite flavor of ice cream, so that is a flavor we're going to make today. Um, the materials you are going to need are ice, vanilla extract, sugar, rock salt, and milk. I'm using whole milk while Jonathan is using almond milk. And the last thing you're going to need in order to make your ice cream are two freezer bags, one gallon and one smaller sandwich size bag. All right, campers, so another fun fact about Colorado milk is that the total amount of milk produced in Colorado each year is 4.8 billion pounds, or that's equivalent to 558 million gallons. So now we're gonna get into making the ice cream. So first, we're going to take our smaller bag and we're going to put in half a cup of whole milk. Or almond milk. Or almond milk, too. Alright, now they have the milk in the bag. 
we're going to put one and a half tablespoons of sugar. And lastly, we're going to put in half a teaspoon of vanilla extract. Alright, now we're going to zip that bag up, get all the air out of it, alright, and we're going to set that aside, and take your gallon size freezer bag, open that up, and we're going to put 4 cups of ice. No. How do Colorado cows compare in milk production compared to other states? I'm not from here. So Colorado cows are really happy cows because they give us the number two ranking for milk production in the nation. That's crazy. All right, now that you have your four cups of ice, now we're going to put in the rock salt. Kosher salt works fine. So we're going to put in four to six tablespoons. So the salt that we're adding lowers the temperature of the ice while melting at the same time. This allows the milk to freeze while also becoming creamy. Alright, so now that we've got our bags of ice and our bags of the mixture of vanilla and the sugar and milk, now we're going to just plop that into the larger bag. Make sure that the top of this bag is also upright in the larger gallon bag. All right. Now we're going to seal it. Let's get all the air out. And now we're going to shake it for five minutes. So what we're doing is that freezing a liquid creates ice crystals. Um, the more that you shake and break up those ice crystals, the smoother the ice cream will be. If your hands start to get cold while shaking your bag, go ahead and grab a towel or an oven mitt. Our hands got really cold. Another fun fact about Colorado dairy is that there are 120 dairy farms in the state of Colorado. And there are approximately 186,000 milk cows. After you shake your bag for about five minutes, you can go ahead and open it up and take out your ice cream. What does yours feel like, Jonathan? Uh, mine is pretty hard. And Kind of squishy too. Mm -hmm. So should we give it a taste? Let's go for it. Let's try it. You can go ahead and taste your ice cream too. Best ice cream yeah, ever. Good. Thanks everyone for stopping by Clam's classroom today. We hope you had fun making ice cream with us. Don't forget to fill out your junior state fair ambassador application. was fun. Thank you to the CSU Agriculture Literacy students for, lear for leading today's CAMS classroom. You can watch this CAMS classroom video again by searching for the Colorado Foundation for Agriculture page on YouTube. The CSU students will be back a little bit later. I hope you enjoyed learning about the Colorado dairy community with me. Before I send you back to our MC, take a moment to write in the chat box something that you learned about dairy. Thank you to Dairy Max for helping to provide some of today's content. To learn more about dairy farmers and the delicious dairy products, visit dairymax.org. They have excellent programs for K-12 educators and students. To learn more about the Colorado Foundation for Agriculture, our free programs and services for pre-K through 12th grade education, 
or to make a tax-deductible gift to support the Colorado Agriculture in the Classroom program, visit growingyourfuture.com. I'll be back with you a little bit later and we'll learn together about Colorado wheat. Feel free to enjoy your ice cream with your funnel cakes. What do you suppose funnel cakes and wheat have in common? We'll find out a little bit later. Thanks, and now back to our MC. Thank you so much, Jennifer and team. I'm absolutely inspired to go home and shake up and make some of my own ice cream. I am typically a gardener, and I have here some really pretty, oh my goodness, where did my flowers go? Oh, oh bananas. Um, <laughs> Let me just check and see. I might have left them behind me. Let me just, let me just go checky here. Do, 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 do. Did somebody say they saw them? What? You're, you're messing with me. I know you're messing. They are not behind me. That, that's my tushy. Oh my goodness, y'all are playing. <gasps> there they are. I know, I think I'm a pretty good gardener. And with a little bit of practice, you could probably be a good dairy farmer or whatever you wanna be. <laughs> Now, I'm having a rootin' tootin' time with all of you, and we have another special guest for you. I'm ever so excited and delighted to introduce Circus Imagination to teach you how to make, achoo, sorry, bubbles. Let's give it over to Ambassador Kayton. Hello, I'm Remaster Kayton with Circus Imagination. Today we're going to be doing some advanced bubble making. So uh, you're going to need a few tools. You're going to need a drill with a drill bit. You might need some help from mom or dad. Uh, you're going to want to pick up some hardware at the hardware store. I have some little swivel clips here, some eye hooks, and then some weights. You can either use large washers or these rings. Also going to need two garden sticks, cotton rope. You're going to need at least 10 feet of cotton rope. I think it comes in 25 or 50 foot lengths. And that's all going to take care of the one. Then for your bubble solution, you're going to need a large bucket, five gallons of water, dish soap. I like clear and unscented. It works a lot better. Uh, some of the brands that I really like are Dawn, Palmolive, and uh, Target's Up and Up. All three of those make really great bubbles. Now, uh, the secret to making bigger bubbles is in the solution. We use a glycerin-based powder called j -Lu, and also a baking powder. So you have three tablespoons baking powder, one teaspoon J lube, 32 ounces of dish soap, five gallons of water. Mix those all up together and let it sit at least 24 hours. Here's another important thing. You let it sit overnight. You let it sit for an extended amount of time. Let all those molecules and mixing get all together and mix up really well. You want to be sure to stir that all up and have a nice mixture sit for a long time. All right. Now the more construction part is the wand, the, excuse me, the bubble wand. So the first thing here, let's move these things out of the way. There we go. And to the wand. So the first thing we're going to do is take our garden sticks here, and we're going to drill in two little holes right here on the very top. I choose my bit depending on the size of the thread of the eye hook. You can see it's just about the same size, so the eye hook's going to be able to grab on good. Now, uh, like I said, you might want mom or dad to help you with this part. Okay. Once that's all drilled in, take your eye hook and screw it on in. Do the same thing with the other one. Once you have both of those done, then it's time to prep the rope. Now to prep the rope, a cotton rope comes with a nylon core inside of it. So what you're gonna do is take the rope, you're gonna work the edges back a little bit, and you'll see this nylon core center. You're gonna take that, pull that, and pull the cotton away from it. You're gonna work that all the way down the 10 foot length. I have just a small section here to show you kind of how that happens. Keep pulling down and eventually the two are separated. Discard the nylon core and you're left with just a cotton rope. This is gonna hold the bubble, bubble solution much, much better. All right, so I'm gonna go with my rope that's all ready to go. 
This is about a 10 foot length. First thing you're going to want to do is divide it in half and find the middle section. Right. Okay. So here's my middle. And with the middle, I'm going to attach my weights. Now how I do this is I just thread it through, make a bigger loop here, and move it back around. And there you go. Holds on to it nice and easy. Ready to go. That's going to be the weight that drops into the bucket. And then these two ends will go up to the top of your stick. So what I like to do is attach these little swivel hooks onto here. My well, first, actually, we attach it onto the, uh, the rope, and then we attach them onto here. All right, now on to making our wand. So we have our cotton rope without the nylon core. We have our weights on the bottom. We have our two garden rods with the eye hooks. So what we're going to do is we're going to find roughly how tall we want it. I usually go for about four feet. I'm going to divide that up just about like so. That's going to give me the two points that I will tie on to the swivel hooks. So just like the weights on the bottom, I pass the rope through the swivel hook and then back around it, hold it tight. Same thing this, with this one, thread it through, open up the rope, pass the hook through it, pull it back. All right, now those two can click on to your eye hooks. And now we just have these loose ends. These loose ends are what's going to make the pattern in the, in the middle. This is where you get to create creative, come up with your own pattern. So first we're going to need to create one that goes along the top here. I actually like to take these two and have them go both across the top and back through the swivel hooks. That gives me a nice thick line at the top, which holds lots of soap. Remember, you're going to want these, uh, this cotton rope to maintain as much soap in it as possible. That's why we took out the nylon core. And if we're able to double up the, the cotton line, it's going to hold that much more uh, bubble solution. All right, so that lets you pull those through. Make sure they're evened up, about the width that you're going to want. And then get creative. So now I'm going to come down here diagonal, and I'm just going to make a simple half hitch. Same thing with this one, come across. Make another simple half hitch. If it crosses this rope, I'll put a tie in here. There's no science to this part, but I'm sure there's some type of science. I don't have the science to this part. I just kind of go with what feels good. I have a whole bunch of different types of wands, all have different types of netting setups. All right, once that's done, then I got to find out a way to get these ends together. I think I'll come in here and finish it off. All right, this one is done. I'm gonna go ahead and take these loose ends and just kind of make them disappear in here. I uh, ideally like to try and get my ends to finish up either here or down at the bottom. Depending upon how much rope you have and how your pattern goes, you might find yourself retying this multiple times. Okay, so take a look at it. That's going to be our one. That's going to give us one, two, three, four, five different pockets to make bubbles with. All right, there we go. So in a review, 32 ounces of clear unscented soap. I like palm olive, up and up, and also uh, Dawn. Then you want one teaspoon of j -Lube, three tablespoons of baking powder to five gallons of water. Then to make your wand, Garden sticks, eye hooks, swivel hooks, swivel, uh, swivel hooks, and your cotton rope with the nylon taken out, some weights tied on the bottom. All right, and you're all ready to head out. Go have some fun with some bubbles. You made some bubbles! <laughs> all right, we just got done making our wand. We made our solution. We found some random kids. Let's make some bubbles. So you can see how the weights help drop it in. That's why the
weight necessary. You want to drop your rope all the way down, make sure it's fully submerged and soaked. When you lift up your garden stick, you look straight up above the bucket. Minimize your grip so you keep as much of that solution. Then you open them up nice and wide and walk back. Always try and keep your wand and rope off the ground. So you don't want to get any grass or dirt or debris inside your, your bubble solution. Once again, keep the point together, lift it straight up, open up nice and wide, and walk backwards. Now today we don't have but if you find that you're, you're doing bubbles on the day that does have wind, wow, super far. If you find that you do have wind, your wind pushing towards your back. So the wind will be going this direction. So that way you just lift it up, open it up, and then the wind will be the bubble solution. Well, I hope you guys had fun making the bubble solution in the barn. If you have any questions or comments, just head on over to the YouTube channel, Circus Imagination at YouTube, and leave it in the comments there. We'll get back to you. Uh, also, you can check on our YouTube channel for more tutorials on hula hoop, face painting, bubble making, and the advanced level. Alright, take care. We'll see you later. Wow, thank you so much, Kayton. That was really, really cool. I'm gonna have to show my hubalicious how to make those oh so delicious bubbles, which I actually don't think are edible. So kids, don't try to eat those at home, but make sure that you have fun and play and get your body moving and get those wiggles out and have a rootin' tootin' time. I know Mr. Pick and Paw and I will be making some bubbles later. I'm ever so excited and delighted for all the things we're learning today and all the things we're gonna continue to learn and see and activities to do. Make sure you're printing out your companion book because there's gonna be some oh so good information in there for you. Now, I have our Director of Agriculture coming back on in, Miss Jennifer. She's gonna teach us about wheat. So ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, get your eyes and ears ready because it's time for Ambassador Jennifer. Thanks for having me back. That was fun. We've had a lot of fun today and I've learned a lot. So when I last left you, I asked you this question. What do funnel cakes and wheat have in common? If you guessed flour, you are correct. As you saw earlier, funnel cakes are made using flour. Now, Chef Jason used Bisquick, but there is flour in Bisquick, and flour comes from wheat. Start thinking about the products that are made from wheat, as we'll learn more about that in a little bit. Before we move on, now is a great time to grab that Classes of Wheat activity page which can be downloaded from the Colorado State Fair webpage. Again, if you have any questions, feel, feel free to put those in the chat feature. Do we grow wheat in Colorado? Yes, we do. This is a map of Colorado agriculture products from the Dep Colorado Department of Agriculture. Can you find the symbol for wheat? It's down here at the bottom. Now take a look at this map real quickly and see which counties you see have the wheat symbol. See it here in Cheyenne and Kiowa and Power and Kit Carson. Let's see, is there any down here? There's some wheat over there in Dolores. There are actually a lot of counties that grow Colorado or that grow wheat. In fact, it, wheat is grown in all regions of the state and in more than 40 of the 64 counties. Colorado is a major wheat producing state, ranking anywhere from fifth to 14th in the United States, depending on the year and the weather conditions for wheat production, according to coloradowheat.org. Are you ready for some more Menti interaction? 
If you kept your Menti browser open, you can go back to it now. Or if you're just joining us, open a web browser on your phone, tablet, or computer and go to menti.com. That's M-E-N-T-I dot com. From there, you will put in the code, which is 15634487. We are going to play all about wheat trivia. I'll give you a few seconds to get started. When I do that, I'm going to pull up my chat. Is everybody joining us? We're going to go ahead and get started with our All About Wheat Trivia. Wheat is a what? Fill in the blank. What is wheat? Our possible answers are grain, shrub, fruit, or vegetable. Five seconds left. You guys are so smart. Voting is closed. Our correct answer is grain. That is correct. A grain is a small, hard, dry seed with or without an attached hull or fruit labor, layer, harvested for human or animal consumption. Other types of grains are corn, rice, oats, and barley. All right, next question. What is the embryo of the wheat kernel called? So this portion right here that I'm pointing to, what is the embryo called? Is it a spike, a germ, a head, or a chaff? If you answered germ, you are correct. The germ is the the small light colored portion of the seed. If I go back to my picture here, the darker tan portion of the seed is called, this is called the endosperm and the outer layer is the bran. All right, next question. I'll give you just a little bit more time on this one. Wheat is measured in what? What is wheat measured in? Let's see, pounds, bushels, heads, or loaves? What is wheat measured in? Nine seconds. All right, our voting is closed. Wheat is measured in bushels. Each bushel of wheat weighs 60 pounds. A common semi-truck grain hopper, as you see here, can hold approximately 1,000 bushels of wheat or 60,000 pounds in a single load. About how many kernels or wheat seeds are found in a single head? How many kernels would be found in one single head? 50, 100, 20, or one? What do you think? Couple seconds left. All right, the answer is 50. Each head of wheat has about 50 kernels. Each wheat plant will develop about five heads. That means on average, one wheat plant will produce about 250 kernels of wheat. What is the machine called that harvests wheat and, prepare, and, and uh, separates the stalk from the wheat? So what is this machine called right here? What do we call that machine? A tractor, a plow, a combine, or a swather? Ten seconds left to answer. All 
We got everybody? You guessed combine, you are correct. Modern combines can cut a swath or section of the field that is more than 40 feet wide. So right there. A guy by the name of Herman Moore patented the first U.S. combine in 1925. Early versions were horse-drawn, followed by some models that were pulled by a tractor, and that's a tractor, modern tractor right there. By the mid-20th century, it saw the combine was the introduction of a self-propelled combine, and by the 1980s, combines began to, be, to come equipped with onboard electronics. Today's new combines have auto steer capabilities, GPS units, and several computer screens so farmers can measure and evaluate the crop as it's being harvested. Okay, just a few more questions left. The head of the wheat plant is used for flour and other foods. What is the stem used for? What is the stem of a wheat plant used for? Is it salad? straw, fertilizer, or flour. You guys are really smart. Couple more seconds. The correct answer is you all got it is straw. You may use straw as mulch in your garden or to put down to protect newly seeded lawns. Farmers and ranchers use straw for animals, mainly cattle and sheep to lay on. What is the factory called where wheat kernels are ground into flour? What is this factory called? Is it an elevator, a mill, a silo, or a farm? What do we think? It's called a mill. If you've driven in, commerce, in the Commerce City area, you may have seen the Ardent Mills flour mill. The mill operates around the clock, sending out 40 truckloads or 1.8 million pounds of flour each day. Wow, that was a lot of information. Thanks for participating. I hope you picked up a few cool facts of wheat trivia. You can now impress your friends and family by sharing those facts. That's all of our mentee activities for the day. We will do more of these activities through the next three days of camp. But we're not done learning about wheat yet. It's time to enter Cam's classroom once again. So grab your classes of wheat activity sheets. Now your sheet is gonna look a little bit different than what the CSU students are going to show us in Cam's classroom, but you should still be able to follow along and complete the worksheets as they complete their activity. I'll fill out my activity sheet as well and we can compare answers at the end. State Fair campers, it's Jenny and Karina, and we're going to be talking about the six classes of wheat. This activity can be found under the wheat germ DNA lesson within Ag in the Classroom. Let's talk about a few of the materials we're going to need today. Today, you're going to need the samples or images of the six classes of wheat. The wheat information cards, the six classes of wheat activity sheet, single sided, and the products made from wheat. You're only going to need one vertical strip per person. You're also going to need scissors, clear masking tape, glue, and a magnifying glass if you have one, but this activity can be done without one. Thanks for going over the materials list with us, Karina. 
before we get started our activity, I have a question for you. Can you tell me what this is a picture of? Hmm. Looks like it's a field, and there's a crop grown in that field. There's some green and gold kernels. Is it a wheat field? It is. Good job. This is a wheat field. Do you know why wheat is grown? Hmm. I know we use it in breads and pastas. Is there more? There is. So in addition to bread and pasta, wheat kernels are used for a variety of products. These products include postage stamp adhesives, straw particle board, paper, hair conditioners, medical swabs, charcoal, and biodegradable plastic eating utensils. Wow, that's awesome. Who knew we were in so many things? Now, why are there six classes of wheat then? That's a great question. Each of these classes has their own specific characteristics or traits. These traits determine the hardiness, shape, color, and what products can be produced. Each of these six classes of wheat all have their own unique climate that they can be grown in and specific planting and harvesting seasons. For example, spring wheat is planted in the spring and then is harvested in the late summer, early fall. Meanwhile, winter wheat is planted in the fall and then is harvested in the spring. So now that we've learned a little bit more about the characteristics of each of the six classes, let's investigate them further. A couple things we need to do before continuing with this activity is cut a strip of the wheat products and then cut each individual picture out. Then, if you don't have the wheat samples, go ahead and do the same thing with the six different classes of wheat and cut one vertical strip and then cut out each individual picture. Now, once you have this done, your next step is to take the top sheet of the activity page and cut horizontally across the dotted lines. You're going to leave the side where it says six classes of wheat intact and you're going to glue on the back side of that and then firmly attach it to the left hand column of the second page. Once these are cut and glued together, it's going to look a little bit like this. All right, campers, now that you have your activity sheets prepared as Karina told us how to, we are gonna go ahead and get our station set up. If you're doing this activity by yourself, you'll need one copy of each of the informational cards. If you're doing this activity as a group or in a class, you'll need to set up, set up six stations, one for each of the classes of wheat. Each of the students will then travel around to each of the stations and visit the information card kernels and take data down on their activity sheets. So when you arrive at your station with the information card, you're going to take your activity sheet and write down all of the information that you can find about that particular class of wheat. You will then take either your kernel samples or the images of your kernels and observe them. Look to see if you can find any specific characteristics. Go ahead and paste those kernels or the image of that kernel to the box that is closest to the spine where you glued the two pages together. That second box is going to be where you will paste the products that you think this class of wheat makes. All of the information that you'll need for this activity sheet can be found within those information cards, so make sure you're being good investigators and read diligently. Let's go ahead and complete the activity together, Karina. campers now that you've completed your activity sheet your sheet should look a little like Karina's I have in the first box my kernel in the second box the product of wheat that can be made and then filled in I have the hardiness shape color products and where it's grown 
All right, campers, now that you've collected all this information, you should be able to make a few conclusions about these six classes of wheat. So Karina, can you tell me about two of the classes of wheat that seem the most similar to each other out of the total six? Based off of the information I gathered, I found that hard red winter wheat and hard spring wheat both have the same color, shape, and hardness. That's great. What similarities and differences were you able to spot out, campers? I noticed after looking at the different classes of wheat, there's hard and soft wheat. Now, do you know the difference? Sure, according to information provided by Ag in the Classroom, hard wheat tends to have a higher protein content. Protein content is important because that is what develops gluten. Gluten is what helps our bread rise, creating more strength, elasticity, and that chewy texture that all of us love in our bread loaves. So, which is better for making bread? The hard wheat would be better for making bread due to that higher protein content. Now that we're talking a little bit about products made from wheat, cake and bread, both made from wheat, but very different textures. Now, does cake have hard or soft wheat? Cake would actually utilize soft wheat because it would have a lower protein content, causing a lower uh, gluten development. This is important because it forms more of a light, flaky texture. Karina, now I have a question for you. I'm a big fan of pasta. From the information that you gathered, can you tell me which of the six classes would be best for making dried pasta? Durham would be the best for making pasta. It's high in protein content and has lots of gluten strength. This allows the pasta to be firm and hold its shape. Wow, Karina, we've learned so much today about the six classes of wheat. We hope you campers learned a little something too. And maybe we'll look at those products made from wheat a little bit differently. Don't forget to take pictures for your Junior State Fair Ambassador application. And we hope to see you next time in Cam's classroom. That was fun. Did you know there were different classes of wheat, let alone six of them? I sure didn't. Now we're going to see how you did completing your activity sheet. So you could use the, the photos and the descriptions on the activity sheet to fill in the blanks. So as we look at hard red, red winter wheat, it's hard like the name says. I called it bullet shaped. You can call it something different and it's reddish brown in color. And there are many food products that can be made from hard red winter wheat and it is grown in Colorado. Next we have hard red spring. It's also hard and bullet shaped and reddish brown, similar to hard red winter wheat. Hard red spring wheat is not grown in Colorado. So we look at soft red spring wheat. It's soft. You're probably getting at the hang of how to fill out this hardness part, portion of, of, the, of the activity sheet. <coughs> I called it barrel shape as it is a little more round than the hard red class. It is also tan in color. Think about all the cookies that can be made from a bushel of soft red spring wheat. It's about 700 cookies according to my good friend Randy Schwalm, who is a wheat farmer near Windsor, Colorado. <laughs> Think about how many glasses of milk you'd need to wash down all those cookies. Yum, cookies and milk just sounds great right about now. Soft white is another soft class that is short and plump and light tan in color. A lot of yummy pastries and cakes are made from soft white. And this class of wheat is mostly grown in the Pacific Northwest. Two of them left are hard white wheat, another hard class, bullet shaped, and, and it's hard and um, 
it's, it's tan in color and can be used to make breads, tortillas, or Asian noodles. Hard white wheat is the king of Colorado. Durham is a hard wheat that is long in shape and amber in color. It is used to make pasta because it is the higher gluten content. All right, thanks for participating in today's agricultural activities. To learn more about wheat, visit coloradowheat.org. Go ahead and put in the chat box something you learned about wheat or list your favorite activity from today. So all of today's activities are from the National Agriculture in the Classroom Curriculum Matrix. This is an online searchable database of free, ready to use lesson plans and activities. You can find the matrix on the CFA webpage at growingyourfuture.com. Thanks for joining me today. We'll learn about a different Colorado product or different pro Colorado agriculture product throughout the next few days of camp. All right, I'm gonna turn it back over to our host to wrap things up. I love you, a bushel and a pack, a bushel and a pack, and a hug around the neck. <laughs> Guess I love you a whole lot, cause I can measure my love in a bushel. Jennifer, thank you so much for teaching us all those goodies about wheat and farming and even dairy and your crew is amazing. Now kids, today is only day one of fair camp. We have got three more days ahead of us. So come on back. We're gonna have more guests and all kinds of exciting things and rootin' tootin' fun. We wanna thank y'all for joining us and thank you so much Circus Imagination and the Colorado State Fair team. And thank you for being here with us because we are learning how to be virtual with all of you. So don't worry, tomorrow will be a lot better. And if you have any suggestions or anything that maybe you wanna see or things that you think could have made your Zoom experience better, as well as ours, let us know in the comments. Now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's time for me, Miss Pick and Paul, to get on home to my hubalicious Mr. Pick and Paul. So I've had a wonderful time. I will see you tomorrow for the Colorado State Fair, Fair Camp. Bye, everybody.